1999, that's the year we started our journey in 12 countries. Fast forward to today, we have carried out surveys in 39 countries. We've captured, captured the voices of 75% of African citizens through 350,000 plus interviews on issues that matter to them, including our signature topics on democracy, governance, economic issues, and the quality of life. On that note, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Emmanuel Jima Bowadi, an esteemed scholar and one of the three founders of Afrobaritan. He's also the founder and former executive director of the, of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, an emeritus professor of political sciences, science at the University of Ghana. Prof. Bowadi has a doctorate from the University of California, Davis, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Ghana, Legon. He's a well-published author, and he has been recognized with numerous awards, including the 2017 Martha Luther King Jr. Award for Peace and Social Justice. In 2021, the new African named him one of the 100 most influential Africans. On that note, I will hand it over to you, Prof, for your welcome remarks. Thank you, Nafi. And um, with this, let me first of all wish all of you distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. And most important to thank you for taking time off your busy schedules to attend this press conference which is the Afrobarometer's inaugural press conference. Our press conference comes at a critical juncture, just three days before Nigerians go to the polls to elect a new president. It also comes in the year 2023, a year in which Africa has a very busy electoral calendar with millions of the continent citizens going to the ballot box in a dozen countries. It has been a great, great honor and a privilege for me to be one of the individuals who started the Afrobarometer in 1999, together with two esteemed colleagues, Professors Michael Bratton, who was for many years a distinguished professor of political science and African studies at Michigan State University, and who is now deservingly retired. And Robert Mattis, formerly at the University of Cape Town and currently with the government and public policy program at the University of Strathclyde. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are extremely proud of the progress we have made over the past two decades. This includes increasing the number of countries surveyed from only 12 in 1999 to as many as 39 in 2022, which is the 10th round or the 10th iteration of our surveys. We also take particular pride in having helped to make public opinion a central pillar of African policy making and democracy. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for over 20 years, Afrobarometer has been dedicated to tracking the attitudes, perspectives, and aspirations of citizens across Africa and conveying our findings to policy actors policy advocates, the media, and others at the national, continental, and global levels. The topics we cover include democracy, governance, economic conditions, social and cultural norms, among many others. The year 2022, that's the past year, was a remarkable one. Firstly, we surveyed an impressive 33 countries in that year, 
a record-breaking achievement in a single calendar year and the first of its kind in our storied history. And even more important, the demand for our data and analysis from policy and development stakeholders on the, on the continent and abroad surged dramatically. Notable mentions include global events such as the COP27, the 77th United Nations General Assembly, the Obama Foundation's Democracy Forum, and the US Africa Leaders Summit. Indeed, it has been deeply gratifying to see and to hear leaders from around the world and on the continent and discourses and debates. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we look ahead, we remain steadfast in our mission to continually share data-driven insights and evidence-based policy options. And we are confident that our efforts will generate tangible outcomes for citizens across Africa. This press event provides us with the opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to ensuring that the voices of African citizens are heard to enable the societies in which they thrive, in, in which they live, sorry, to thrive. It, is, it also gives us a good platform to formally thank all of you for your continuing support for our work in the various ways by which you as media actors, media operators, researchers, scholars, amplify our findings to wider audiences. By your own commitment to accurate and timely usage and reporting has enabled us to make a bigger impact on the issues on which we research and on the data that we generate, resulting in the end in greater influence on national dialogues and policy discourses. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, let me thank you for your invaluable contribution to our work. On that note, I will hand over to you, Nafi. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Jima uh, Bowadi, for your kind words toward the African journalists. Indeed, uh, through their support, uh, they've been we've been able to amplify our work and create a bigger impact. Uh, you also said it, the year 2022 uh, has been a remarkable one, uh, with surveys carried out in 33 countries in just one calendar year. Uh, Time for a deeper dive into the issues at hand. We are thrilled to be joined by our CEO, Joseph Asunta. Joseph brings a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge and experience from his previous roles at the HP Foundation and the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. Joseph has taught courses on African politics, political economy of development, research methods, and data analysis. His research interests include topics such as elections and electoral processes, but also migration. Born in Ghana, Joseph holds a PhD in political science from UCLA. Joe, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Nafi. And uh, to echo Jim's words of thanks to our esteemed partners who continue to amplify our work, we're really grateful and thank you so much for joining us today. As you all probably know, our principal objective is to give African citizens a voice in decision making and policy making as well. And we do this through collecting information on a regular basis, getting their experiences, their views, and their aspirations so that we can collate, analyze, and share it with the general public. And I think we don't do this alone. We rely on partners like yourselves who allow us to amplify the voices of African citizens. And I think together as we work through 
the next steps of our program, we would continue to call on you and continue to rely on you to help us amplify the voices of African citizens in policy discourse. Of course, as already mentioned, we've conducted surveys in up to 39 countries on the continent. The hope is to eventually cover the entire continent if conditions allow. And so we continue to work in ways that allows us to gather citizen voices that can be reflective of the entire continent. At the moment, of course, we do cover more than 75% of the views of Africans, uh, African citizens. So um, for the year 2022, I know my colleague Gemma has already mentioned some of the significant milestones we've achieved, but I just want to highlight a few things. So we completed our 10 year strategy in, during last year, and this strategy is supposed to guide our work in the next five survey rounds. And for those who know our work well, each survey round takes between 18 to uh, 12 to 18 months. And so it does travel the 10 year period we would have about five iterations of the surveys. So we completed the strategy, which was a big milestone for us. We did establish a separate communications unit. And so some of the activities that we conduct in order to drive the agenda in making sure that certain voices reach the right people, we needed to have a separate communications unit and that was successfully uh, established. We also completed surveys in more than 30 countries within one calendar year, which I'm repeating here largely because it is an unprecedented um, achievement across the, for, for the, in the history of our network. And that's certainly a, a big congratulations to the team that is behind this, but also to all our partners who work on making sure that we drive this uh, program forward. So um, I'm just going to give a key, few key highlights of some of the findings that we are beginning to see from the current round of the survey. We are in the ninth round of the survey going, and I want to mention just a few highlights, and then I'll conclude by letting you know what the future looks like, what we're going to do, especially for this year coming. So first of all, to state that even though we're, we're working to cover up to 39 countries this round. We have so far had data for 20 countries. And what I'm mentioning now is just some of the data that are results that we have from the 20 countries. So across the continent, the good news is you know, Africans are still solidly committed to democracy and that still remains a majority view. They prefer democracy to any other form of government. Clear majorities still con uh, endorse democratic uh, norms and practices such as elections, parliamentary oversight of the president, media freedom, limits on presidential tenure, all of these are still majority views. And so it gives us some confidence that when it comes to the demand side of democracy, Africans are solidly in support of democracy and democratic norms and practices. Preference for accountable governance continues to grow and that's a critical indicator for us because it's not just our government being effective, but that governments are accountable to their people. And that is what Africans are increasingly demanding. But the, the story is not all that rosy. Uh, there are some findings that are a bit worrying. And the one that I want to highlight here is resistance to military intervention in politics. Even though we still have a majority, almost close to seven in 10 Africans still reject military rule, we've seen that this rejection rate has actually dropped over time, almost about eight percentage points from, well, it was about 75% the last round, the last round we conducted these studies and the current round, it has dropped at least in the 20 countries that were covered, it has dropped to about 67%. So the popular resistance to military intervention is not as strong as it used to be. And that is one of the worrying findings we have in the current survey. I'll touch briefly on corruption and climate change. So on corruption, as you may all be aware, you know, across the continent, these surveys that were conducted, corruption has actually you know, increased in most countries. And that's the perceived corruption across the 20 countries we've surveyed, increased about seven percentage points during this period. The third point I want to highlight is climate change. And here is a mixture of good news and some not so good news. First of all, across the continent, we have about half of Africans telling us they are aware of climate change. And among these, those who are aware of climate change, we have quite a significant a high number, almost close to 80% saying that it is making life more difficult. 
And as a result, we are not surprised that most Africans are calling on their governments and other stakeholders to take action now and to take action even if that means it will cause some harm to the economy or some job losses. So it gives us um, a signal that Africans are ready to sacrifice to make sure that we can limit climate change as we move forward. And of course, many Africans are also not satisfied with the way their governments are tackling you know, climate change, and they are hoping that governments will do more in this space. The good news is that there's a sense of shared responsibility when it comes to who limits climate, who should be responsible for limiting climate change. We have across the board, citizens see it as a, a collective action. Right? It has to be shared between governments, citizens themselves, the private sector, and international actors. And so that's a big piece of good news for us, that Africans are really committed to you know, helping to mitigate climate change. They are not putting it only on governments, they see themselves playing a role. Because for those who are interested, if you go on your website, there's a lots of lots of uh, publications out there that will document some of these findings. But looking ahead to this year, what we're now working on to do is to complete the round nine surveys. We have two countries outstanding, that is Congo Brazzaville and Guinea-Bissau. It is possible that we'll do um, Ethiopia as well, but we are still um, hoping that the peace deal will hold and that we'll be able to conduct the survey in Ethiopia. The second is to conduct a pre-election survey in Zimbabwe. Uh, plans are already far advanced and we'll be able to conduct a pre-election survey in Zimbabwe. And this pre-election survey will actually include some trainings for journalists, for civil society organizations and political parties just in Zimbabwe as part of the process leading towards the, the elections themselves, hopefully in July. We're also planning to organize a network-wide meeting in Accra here at the Afrobarometer headquarters, and that will take place in May. And the planning meeting is for the next round of the survey. That will be the tenth round of the survey. We are hoping to complete our round 10 survey questionnaire by the summer of this year and hopefully start rolling out the round 10 survey sometime later towards the end of this year. And finally, we are planning to implement a series of capacity building uh, programs across the continent this year. And that capacity building or training program that will bring in training and basic analysis and quantitative skills will happen across different groups, including journalists. And I'll say a little more about that at the closing. So this is what I have to mention here and certainly more than happy to respond to any questions that colleagues may have. So I'll turn it back to you, Nav. All right, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for walking us down memory lane and sharing highlights of uh, the year 2002. Uh, this opens up uh, the door to explore the breadth and depth of our work with the next speaker, who we affectionately call the tall man from Zomba, Malawi. Boniface Dulani is the director of surveys for Afrobarometer and an associate professor of political science in the Department of Politics at the University of Malawi. Boni holds a PhD in comparative politics with a minor in inter international relations from Michigan State University. His main area of research and publication are democracy and governance, presidential term limits, political economy analysis, public health, participation of women and youth in politics, to name a few. It is my pleasure to hand it over to you, Bonnie. Thank you, Nafi. Um, thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my colleagues from Afrobarometer. Uh, a number of the highlights that I'm going to be referencing have already been touched on by uh, my board chair, Professor Jima Boadi and, uh, and Joe. Uh, as both have highlighted, I think 2022 has been quite a historic year for us. Uh, for the first time, as both have uh, pointed out, we uh, managed to fill the 33, a total of 33 surveys. Uh, that's an average of uh, three surveys a month, which is really quite unprecedented for us. And we hope we will build on this achievement and the, uh, seek to reduce the time that it takes for us to fill our surveys. Uh, the 33 surveys that we did in 2022, uh, in addition to the four round nine surveys that we did in 2021, so that gave us really a total of 37 uh, round nine uh, surveys that were completed by the end of 
2022. And as both Joe and Jima pointed out, we also anticipated to field further uh, an additional two round nine surveys this year, uh, possibly three with the addition of Ethiopia. That should give us a total of 40 surveys uh, for round nine. And again, this will be the highest number of surveys in any uh, single survey round that we have done as Afrobarometer. The 33 surveys that we completed in 2022, so do, represent, do reflect, I think, our goal to give people, ordinary citizens on the continent, a voice uh, in how they governed and, and indeed a say in how they are governed. Uh, the 33 surveys really did involve uh, more than 40,000 individual uh, interviews with ordinary citizens uh, spread across the continent in both rural and the urban areas uh, uh, of the continent. Uh, in addition to these surveys, we also did complete four pilot telephone surveys during the year. As Afrobarometer, we've always traditionally uh, conducted our surveys face to face, but we are also mindful of the time that it takes and I think the need for uh, quicker, quick surveys. But uh, we are also very deliberative in the way we adopt new technology. So we are exploring this opportunity to conduct and the feasibility of conducting a telephone service. Our four pilots were done in one in Botswana, two in Zambia, and one in Burkina Faso. As we move forward, I think this year we hope to also expand this pilot telephone service to a further four countries across the continent that we are yet, I think, to determine, I think, where we will do this. Uh, the pilot telephone service do give us not an, an, an alternative to face-to-face -face service, but the pilots themselves give us a chance to compare our regular face-to-face -face service with how those the findings from those compare with telephone uh, service. Uh, as Joe did point out in his presentation, we are also constantly exploring ways of expanding our footprint across the continent. So although we have uh, managed to reach these 40 countries, we, it is our hope, and as Joe has pointed out, to even go further and cover the entire continent. In 2022, we did expand into four countries, uh, Congo Brazzaville, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Seychelles, um, as well as Mauritania. And again, we will be exploring uh, what are the new countries to expand to uh, in the coming year. Uh, one of the challenges that we always encounter in terms of which countries we can work in uh, is the availability of research organizations that we can work with uh, to do surveys. And in, in, in 2022, we did explore with other innovative ways of fielding surveys directly, but with the involvement of local contractors on the ground. And this is the approach we tried and piloted in Seychelles and Sao Tome. And I think the lessons from that give us, I think, hope that even in countries where we do struggle to find local research organizations to work with us, there is also always that possibility that we can employ the lessons from these two countries as we, again, seek to expand our footprint. Uh, Joe has highlighted, I think, quite a number of the uh, plans for 2023. From our perspective as a survey, you know, a survey unit, uh, we have already started to plan for around 10 surveys, uh, as well as the plans to wrap up around nine surveys in those three countries. Uh, Joe has already alluded to the uh, pre-election survey that is uh, forthcoming in Zimbabwe, but we also do hope to carry out another uh, pre-round survey, mid-round survey in, uh, in Uganda, where we have uh, a collaboration with the Netherlands uh, embassy uh, there. We also, of course, as already highlighted, planning to field additional telephone, uh, pilot telephone surveys, uh, as well as I think continue to explore uh, new countries where we can expand to in this coming year. So I think these are really the key highlights from our side, and we're looking forward to uh, starting and launching the new uh, surveys in, uh, you know, in later this year. Uh, that will be preceded by a planning meeting that will be held in Ghana, as Joe has already alluded to. Uh, back to you, Nafi. Thank you very much, uh, Bonnie. Uh, before I hand it over to Caroline, just to remind you that uh, this press conference is being translated in French and Portuguese, so you can follow those two channels. And uh, a reminder to paste your Q&A in the box down below. 
Uh, in light of the valuable insight provided by Bonnie, uh, we want to move with speed and scale and uh, increase our footprint on the continent. We will now hear from Caroline Logan, our Director of Analysis. Caroline is an Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at the Michigan State University. She joined Afrobarometer in 21. She has an incredible institutional memory. Uh, Caroline's research interests include democratization and political development in Africa, especially in East Africa, the Horn and Somaliland. Caroline lived and worked in Kenya, Lesotho, Rwanda, Somaliland, and Somalia for nearly a decade before joining MSU and Afrobarometer. On that note, it's over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Nathi, and thank you for everybody to everybody for joining us today um, to, to hear about what we've been doing. We're really proud of some of these accomplishments and uh, really excited to share them with you. Um, I'm going to talk some about what we do uh, after we've got the data collected. Um, Afrobarometer's goals have always gone beyond just collecting the great quality data that, under Bonnie's leadership to getting the data out there into the public domain. Um, our aim has been to reach diverse audiences with our findings, uh, everybody from ordinary citizens to senior policymakers, uh, the media, policy advocates, academics, business leaders. We want to get the, the data into as many hands as possible so that African voices are heard in policy debates through many different channels. Um, we therefore, one of the things that we've increasingly done over the years is produce a diverse array of outputs um, from, from quite simple outputs to the more complex so that we can connect to different audiences at their places where they are. Um, these include press releases, basic infographics. Um, we also do blog posts, videos, and then Afrobarometer publications such as dispatches and policy papers, as well as summaries of results. And then occasionally we also produce special projects such as our SDG scorecards that were released in 2022, uh, 2021, excuse me. Um, we also work with the communications team closely both to develop these outputs and to release them through multiple channels. Again, trying to reach many different audiences. So we use our website, social media, webinars, uh, and, and other public events, media briefings, and so on. The goal again is to reach as many users of the data as possible with findings packaged in ways that they can understand, interpret, and act on. Um, the other uh, aspect of Afrobarometer that data that comes into this is that we cover many, many different topics. Um, you've already heard about some of these. Uh, we cover democracy and governance have always been our signature topics, but we also cover, collect data on perspectives on and experiences on education and health, climate change, environmental governance, taxation, youth, gender equality, and a whole host of other issues. Um, so uh, it, it can sometimes, uh, from where I sit, seem like we're, we have too much data. That we, it's hard to get it all out there. But in most cases, one of the key things that we try and do is break our data down into concise topics um, so that we can, can package it in ways that are, are easy to use and digest. To prioritize topics, we continuously track media and current events, monitor ongoing policy debates, and also respond to what our own respondents and our stakeholders tell us about their priorities. Uh, this prioritization is done both by our national partners at the country level when they're releasing uh, country results and by our analysis and communi communications team working at the continental level. For example, in 2022, um, we prioritized findings on climate change because of uh, events such as Africa Climate Week, uh, which took place in, in August, September, and the COP27 meetings that took place in November. In anticipation of these events, we focused our analysis, or what we call running the numbers, on our newest climate change findings from round nine. Our key goal being to identify the most interesting, important, and actionable findings that we are getting out of that data. For example, Joe's mentioned uh, the finding that across the, the first 20 countries that we surveyed for round nine, we were finding that a remarkable 78% of people said that they want their governments to take steps now to limit the impacts of climate change, even as, if it's expensive and difficult for their national economies to absorb. And I should say 78% of the people who say they've heard of climate change. Once we've identified our topics and our priorities for, for releasing data, 
um, the most important and actionable findings are identified, and then we develop an array of products. Uh, in the case of climate change, that included infographics, blog posts, press releases. And in this case, we produced a special project uh, product, our climate change country cards. These give a summary of key findings for each country in a simple, primarily visual format that kind of encapsulates the climate change understandings and perspectives and experiences for each country. Uh, we simultaneously, with the communications team, develop strategies to release and promote those findings. And in this case, our ultimate goal was to both to inform and influence the policy discussions that were taking place in Gabon and in Egypt. Other topics that we prioritized during 2022 and coming up in 2023 include elections. There's, a, as, as everybody's aware, some several major elections this, this year, including one coming up in just a few days. Um, and where, uh, where necessary, term limits. Um, Bonnie is, is one of our experts on term limits, and this is one of our most common and frequently cited and actionable findings in cases unlike Nigeria, where presidents may not respect um, existing term limits. Uh, we'll also be doing a lot this year on gender equality and gender-based violence, police professionalism, environmental governance, child welfare, and a number of other topics. Finally, I'll just add that in addition to our country-specific findings that our national partners release, we also produce a series of topic-specific Pan-African profiles, or PAPs. These um, report comparative findings across all countries for each selective topic uh, to, give, to give a more continental perspective. So those um, are also available on our website, and we produce them across many, many of the topics that I've mentioned. The last thing I just want to say is that, um, as, as has been mentioned by Joe and a couple other people, it, in addition to the two pillars of collecting great quality data and getting it out there into the public domain and the public debate, one of uh, Afrobarometer's core uh, pillars since its beginning has been our capacity building program um, and, and building the capacity across the continent, both to collect the top quality data and to do the analysis and the communications on these topics. Um, I think one of the achievements that we're especially proud of over the years is the fact that at this point, the vast majority of these many products that I'm talking about are being produced by our national partners themselves and their staff and our own Afrobarometer staff. Um, and we've got a, a growing um, and continuing capacity building program that will work through webinars, seminars, summer schools, workshops, mentoring, uh, fellowships and many other means to continue to build that capacity to do this work across the continent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. This is extremely important work. And Caroline and team turned the data set collected into products and evidence that shines a light on the road ahead for policymakers and decision makers, and also for us journalists. Uh, Caroline, you said it too much. You have a feeling that you have too much data, but too much data is good for us uh, uh, journalists. Now it is time to shift gear and hear from you. Uh, as we move to the second segment of this press conference, do not hesitate to share your thoughts on social media. We will be using the hashtag Voices, Voices Africa. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can either paste it in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and we will open your mic so you can ask your question. I do not see any questions in the Q&A box. Uh, hands, if you want to, your hands, please. If you want to ask a question to our panelists. All right, I see one question from an anonymous attendee. That's fine too. Who are you hoping to collaborate with in Ethiopia? And when should the survey be ex expected? So I think that question is for you. Bonnie, and everybody else is uh, welcome to chip in. Thank you uh, for that question. Um, in Ethiopia, we work with the Abukon consultants. Uh, they are our national partner in Ethiopia. Uh, I think this is the team that we work with, and uh, it is our hope that we also will be collaborating with other uh, partners, including uh, international development uh, organizations, 
uh, that will be that are also interested in this. But also, I think the uh, government in Ethiopia uh, and uh, indeed academics, civil society organizations, and other stakeholders that are keen to use our data. Thank you, Nafi. Back to you. Thank you. Bonnie, I see Joe, you're typing an answer. Do you want to share your answer with the participants? Yeah, no, I was just going to say in terms of when we can expect this, I mean, the hope is that we'll complete this survey by this, at least at the beginning of the second quarter of this year. That's our hope, but that is conditional on the peace deal holding going forward. All right, thank you for your answers on Ethiopia. Uh, if you have additional questions for our speakers, you can either raise your hand or paste your question in the Q&A box in your language of preference, whether it's French, Portuguese, or English. All right, so um, Dr. John, I believe all the panelists can see the questions. And uh, right, the question is, there are many governance indices out there, but Afrobarometer stands out, tall among all of them. Keep up the good work. That was a comment. Thank you so much for that comment, uh, Dr. Osaye. We have a question. Who are typically the audience you target to reach with your data? This is an open question to all of you panelists. Who are our audiences? Prof, Caroline, do you want to take that one? And then yeah, I'll go over I'll, to you, Prof, yes. I'll take, I'll take that one. Um, so so our, our core goal in terms of getting the data out there is to, to uh, get the voices heard and, and get the data used by many different audiences. So um, we, we actually have a pretty diverse target audience. Um, we certainly target journalists because um, getting coverage in the media of the findings is one of the best ways to get the data out into, uh, especially into the hands of ordinary citizens. Um, so in addition to doing press releases and press conferences, we have people often, we get involved in radio interviews and radio programs um, and, and other kinds of interaction with the media to get it out there uh, um, through those means. We also um, certainly target governments and policymakers with the data. So again, um, there may be, that can be through through the media or through, um, uh, we, we sometimes do special uh, presentations for different government audiences or audiences of policymakers. Um, and we, we try and get it into the hands also of activists, civil society organizations who use the data, um, whether it's for program planning or for uh, evaluation of implementation or also used to hold governments accountable. So we have a, a really diverse, um, uh, audience. We also um, interact a lot with it on um, with the international donor organizations and find funding organizations. So we have a really wide array of, of uh, audiences for the data. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues would add to that. Anybody wants to add to that? Yeah, just to add briefly, I mean, beyond the, the, the policy makers and policy actors and activists and journalists, I think we are increasingly trying to target students on the African continent. Often, you know, you know, and students are doing, you know, studying at a master's level or PhD level, getting data to write dissertations can be difficult. And this data is a rich source for them to be able to do that. So part of our programs, as Caroline mentioned, our capacity building program is to reach out to university faculties social science faculties and bring this data to them. I mean, it can cut across whether you're in statistics or social sciences and the like. So students are increasingly becoming a center as well. All right, now, thank you, Joe. And uh, we have, yeah, you would like to add something, Caroline? Uh, well, I just add, wanted to add a follow-up on uh, Dr. Osai Kapong's uh, comment about the, the Afrobarometer uses indices, just to mention that Afrobarometer data um, we create our own indices and put out our own data, but it's also used by a number of different global organizations in their own governance indicators. So the World Bank governance indicators use Afrobarometer data. Um, Economist Intelligence Unit uses Afrobarometer data in their assessments. And the Mo Ibrahim Foundation um, 
originally used our data as one component in their um, governance indicators, but now actually use it as sort of a comparative, a reality check on the on the indices that they create based on other sources. They they put the public opinion uh, findings alongside it as kind of a reality check on on their indicators. So it it's used both for our indicators and many other global governance indicators. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. I see uh, questions coming in the chat box, in the Q&A box, but I have one hand that is raised. Uh, uh, Sir Adam Alkali, we'll open up your mic so you can ask your question. Okay, thank, thank you so much, uh, Afrobarometer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Algali. I'm uh, the editor of African News Page, uh, which is a digital news magazine focused on reporting uh, development issues on the continent, guided by the EU's Agenda 2023. I'm excited to be here and to see that you know Afrobarometer has taken this step to engage with the media uh, to create awareness about the important work you are doing on data for development on the continent. Uh, and, I, and I wish to say that. Uh, Uh, you know, uh, really looking forward to the work you are doing and to help publicize it uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the African citizens because ultimately whatever work you do uh, is, uh, is, is targeted to, like you said, to, to the policy makers, but also to African citizens. And I hope uh, that in the future we are going to see more collaboration with African media uh, to popularize your very important work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. We really appreciate your contribution. Um, any comments on that? Uh, otherwise, we have a very interesting question as well on the in the Q and A box. How seriously your data and recommendations are taken into account by policymakers in our continent? Can you illustrate with an example? And the question is from a gentleman called Farid Muasi. Any anybody wants to take that question? Right. Uh, so I'll start and so first, first of all, our data, as we mentioned at the beginning, usually when we complete our service in any country, the first point of contact is to do a confidential briefing to the government. And that is largely for, for courtesy reason, but also secondly, to make sure that they are aware of some of the key findings from our data. And many governments have used this data in many ways, sometimes wrongly, sometimes really for good purpose. And I'll give an example. In the case of Botswana, we had a finding that showed that the people of Botswana are relatively more tolerant towards the LGBTQI community and in terms of uh, um, same-sex relationships. And as a result of that finding, that finding actually gave the government the basis to go ahead and pass a policy around you know, normalizing or legalizing same-sex relations in Botswana. But I mean, we have several of similar stories where governments use our data as an anchor for what they do, because it does provide them a sense of where citizens' priorities and preferences and experiences lie. And based on that, they can then go further to either adopt the policy or enact a legislation to be consistent with what citizens' priorities and preferences are. If you go onto our website, we have a site that is dedicated to impact stories, and you can see some of the examples that we have listed out there. But my colleagues may want to add that is uh, Caroline Bonnet, Jim. Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. Um, you know, one of the the one type of findings I think that have had some of the most impact and generated the most action has often been our findings on corruption. Um, Bonnie could tell stories about uh, the findings that were released last year in, in Malawi, for example, on corruption that really generated, uh, that, that had the, the finding, included the finding that the police were um, the most corrupt institution and have generated a lot of um, follow-up and feedback and promises of action. I think we've seen the same in Ghana and Sierra Leone and a number of other countries where um, governments have taken the, the findings quite seriously and actually taken action to improve uh, systems of accountability. We do sometimes get the opposite, which can be pushback and resistance to findings. Um, but I think especially as our 
scope and our uh, and people's awareness of our work and our credibility has grown that it becomes easier for us to to stand you know to to um uh you know stand by the results and and put the pressure on the governments to respond to them as opposed to just trying to dismiss the work that we do just if i may add just a few notes to that again just to to say that the usage of alphabetical data uh, differs from country to country and also within countries from ministries, departments, and agencies to the other. So for instance, um, our findings regarding um, social development, equity, uh, inclusion, and so on, have tended to be used by uh, social welfare, uh, social development ministries, agencies, and departments. The findings um, on, uh, on judicial integrity have been used in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, and elsewhere by justice ministries and by uh, the, the, the Supreme Court leadership. You know, so it really depends and the country and where they are at in terms of reforms that they are pursuing. But what we find is that policymakers often find it useful to pick the sets of data that speak to their agenda. But so far as we are concerned, that is all to say that policymakers who pick up parameter data are listening to uh, the voices of citizens. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A in Portuguese. I will let the translators uh, translate that for me. But I will give the floor to Caroline. She wanted to add a response to the question from a graduate student on how they can benefit uh, Afrobarometer data. Caroline? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize how um, how foundational it is to Afrobarometer, the, the goals both of transparency and of being a public good. So um, in addition to all the ways I talk about where we're trying to put findings out there, we also make our data publicly available. We release data sets one year after the completion of field work. Uh, and in some cases sooner, if, if uh, people have good case to make for early release. Um, and, and part of the goal of that is to get it out into the hands of graduate students and faculty and people all over the place uh, to also do analysis. I mentioned how much we how much data we've got, how many topics it covers. We can't do all the analysis ourselves. So we really put it out there and try and make it a public good that serves the continent in, in every way we can. So the data is available on our website and people are free to also get in touch with us if they have questions about how they can get engaged and make use of it. Um, and Dominique is also um, here as, as a representative of our, of our capacity building program that also is working with a lot of graduate students um, to help them uh, develop the skills to make use of the data. So thank you. Right. I think uh, at this point, maybe we'll hand it over to Dominique to talk about the summer camps and the capacity building modules we have to train the next generation of uh, researchers, African researchers. Dominique? Thank you so much, Nafi. Um, Carolyn touched on some of our plans in her earlier presentation. Um, but just to give you a brief overview of some of the capacity building um, plans we have coming up. Um, last year, we relaunched our summer school program, which was unfortunately um, postponed for a few years due to COVID-19. So we got that up and running again, which was very successful, um, both in French, which was hosted in Senegal, and in English, which was hosted in Pretoria in South Africa. Um, some of the plans we have um, scheduled for 2023 include um, summer school programs again, both in French and English. Um, writing workshops and um, the intention behind our writing workshops is to further develop the, the publications that um, participants were working on during their summer school um, attendance, um, thematic workshops, which we are um, hoping would cover um, GIS analysis and um, advanced regression analysis in 2023. Um, as well as some very basic introductory training to CSO representatives and journalists, which um, Carolyn and I think Nafi also mentioned. 
Um, one of our um, newer developments is to do some more university outreach. So both within the faculty, but also um, with students, um, hopefully introducing more students to Afrobarometer and, and the vast, vast um, library of, of, of data that we have available. Um, another new component that we're adding this year is a mentorship program, um, as well as a few fellowship opportunities for, for our staff and, and um, close partners. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, engaging with, with some of you in, in some of those training opportunities. And um, we will publicize those on our website and on all our social media accounts. So you can just follow Afrobarometer wherever you can to, to stay informed about those. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Dominique. And I really encourage you to reach out to our regional communication coordinators. We have Asafika in Southern Africa, uh, Simon in East Africa. Um, we have Hassana Jallo in uh, West Africa francophone and Mame Akwa for West Africa uh, anglophone and Northern Africa. Of course, the central team is coordinated by Josephine Apia, who is a uh, knowledge manager and communication manager and our own digital uh, specialist, our manager who handles new media is Shannon. So reach out to them. Their contacts are on the website and um, I work with this uh, wonderful team to deliver on uh, our ambitions and uh, objectives. So on to the questions again. I have a question from uh, Jill Mada. What are the most common challenges you come across when you conduct your field work? And the beauty about moderating is like I have a little power. So I'm sending this question to you. I'm directing it, directing it to Bonnie. Bonnie, can you take that one for us? Thank you. I, I was anticipating that, I have to say. Um, like, I think it, it, it's always a pleasure, I think, to do service on this continent. I think most of the people we speak to, no one has ever asked them, I think, their views on the kind of issues that we ask them. And I'm prefacing this, I think, before I answer the question, because, uh, you know, the service we do, our questionnaire sometimes takes as long as an hour and a half to answer. Uh, and I know, I think, you know, having worked with my colleague Caroline, I think in, in, in the US, that when people call, uh, you know, posters call and ask you questions, usually 10 minutes is, is way too long. Our, our challenge, I think, in doing the surveys for the most part is that we actually have people who wanted to say quite a lot because this is maybe one of the few opportunities to tell us and share with their views. That notwithstanding, I think we do experience and encounter quite a number of challenges. Um, I think the first one I would cite, I think, access to uh, recent census data. Uh, because for us to draw the samples for our service, we do need uh, a recent census data and usually, uh, preferably, I think uh, census data that is not older than 10 years. Uh, in some of our cases, I think we do face uh, challenges in access accessing the data, either because it's not available or uh, you know, it, it, the bureaucracy to access that data is problematic. And uh, we did encounter this challenge in Eswatini, for example, uh, in 2022, where we had it already trained our enumerators and we were ready to go to the field, but then we encountered challenges in accessing uh, census data and so much that we had to delay the launch of field work uh, for, for, for several weeks. And we actually had to retrain our enumerators once we had access to that uh, census data. Uh, another major challenge is insecurity. Uh, we had wanted to field the survey in Ethiopia in 2022, but again, the, uh, the, the civil war in Tigray, uh, as well as I think insecurity in the Oromo uh, region, as well as other you know, provinces uh, around Tigray, just made it impossible for us to field the survey. We are really you know, appreciative of the peace that has, uh, that has now ensued, and that's what has opened the new window that enables us to go to Ethiopia, but it's not the only country. In Burkina Faso, uh, the, the, the military coup last year happened right in the middle of our survey, which disrupted obviously our field work. Uh, in Mali, 
uh, in in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique. Uh, just to mention a few uh, a few places where we have encountered these kind of challenges. Uh, most of us will so uh, know that we do face a lot of our countries do face infrastructure challenges. Um, and in some cases, actually, these challenges uh, do stand in our way in going into some countries, for example, the DRC, but even in the countries where we're already going to, we always constantly you know, encounter challenges in accessing uh, the areas that we have selected. Because the selection of our samples and, and enumeration areas is a purely random, and we always want to give each and every adult citizen an opportunity uh, to be selected. So we have to send teams, sometimes our teams uh, have to leave at dawn, and, and they have to travel hours uh, to reach their, the sample the enumeration areas, and sometimes they have uh, you know, to walk long distances, in some cases uh, go on horseback to just access the enumeration areas. But it, uh, we are always grateful that our enumerators really go uh, you know, that extra mile to make sure that every uh, that citizen on this continent has a chance to be selected. Uh, we also have to translate our questionnaire into a language of the respondent's choice. And, and obviously this uh, means that every citizen has a chance to answer our question in a language that they are most comfortable with uh, and, and that they can understand the questions uh, very well. The challenge is that on our continent, we do have languages that are spoken, but not written. And sometimes, even if they are written, it's hard to find uh, enumerators that are educated to the level that they can uh, interview survey respondents uh, in those languages. Uh, we also do encounter, unfortunately, sometimes political challenges, uh, because the questions we do ask uh, sometimes are pretty sensitive on questions, uh, on issues um, that affect ordinary citizens like corruption. But uh, you know, sometimes I think even assessing performance uh, of, of governments, of, of heads of states, and sometimes I think the sensitivity to these questions uh, do lead to a number of problems. And I, uh, Burundi, for example, we used to work in Burundi, but we did encounter challenges last time when we released results on attitudes, I mean, opinion on presidential term limits at a time when the former late president, PM Kuluziza, was seeking a third term. And when we released our findings, that suggested Burundians were actually in favor of presidential term limits. That did not go down well to the point that our national uh, investigator for Burundi was forced into exile, and unfortunately, and so very sadly, he actually ended up dying uh, in exile. Uh, but uh, these are just some of the challenges. Of course, you know, in 2020, 2021, uh, we encountered uh, COVID-19 that none of us had anticipated, and this put spanners in our works, and we had uh, to suspend uh, field work because of that. But again, I mean, uh, uh, some of our enumerators and, and survey teams are very creative. Uh, in Zambia, some years back, our network sampling specialist, who's a trained engineer, actually helped his team to build uh, a bridge just to access uh, an enumeration area by road. Uh, so these are just some logistical challenges. Some of them are not, uh, we still find ways to get around them. Some of them are a challenge, but in this, most of them we do uh, we do manage to get around. Uh, thank you, Nafi. Thank you, thank you, Bonnie. I mean, time is really against us. We just have, um, uh, time is up actually, but uh, there are a few questions, if you don't mind, uh, panelists to stay. For a few moments, we have a question uh, from, uh, I think it's a question on the uh, margin of error. And Jamie, you were typing a um, response. Maybe you can take that and then we'll go immediately to Youssef, our national uh, partner in Tunisia, who has uh, raised his hand for a question. So Jamie and then uh, Youssef uh, Medeb. Enough, if I may, may it have yes. been briefly. Uh, there is um, a question somebody on the call who wants to uh, get get a sense of our uh, pre-election surveys and election relevant uh, data in general. 
That's great. So that will be the third question. And uh, I'm hoping to wrap up after that. So Jamie, on to you, then Yousef, and we'll answer the question on elections. Thank you, Daphne. Um, I typed out a response to the um, attendee just indicating that our margin of error does depend on the sample size per pre election survey. And so we generally do make this information available in our code books and our summaries of results. Um, and these are publicly available on the country pages. So it does depend on the sample size for our pre eviction surveys, which has varied from 3,600 res respondents um, to 2,400 or 1,200 respondents. Um, so yes, I would encourage you to take a look at these documents so that you can see for the specific pre eviction survey that you'd like to um, use what the margin of error may be, but it generally varies around um, 1.5 to 3%. Um, and I've also posted a response to your second question um, on governments reacting to our findings. Um, I specifically have the example of the um, COVID paper that we wrote for South Africa and what the response was to that from um, the South African government. But I'm sure that my colleagues also have some anecdotal evidence as to other um, you know, responses that we've received from governments. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for uh, shedding a light on that uh, question. Uh, I see another question before. Yes, Youssef, uh, you have the floor. If we can open up his mic. Uh, yeah. Are you hearing me? Yes, Hello? we can hear you, Youssef. You, we yeah, can hear okay, you. perfect. Okay, good to see all of you. Uh, and congrats to, to all of us for reaching this exceptional target of 40 countries. Hope the context, the local context in some countries will change so that we can reach more than that. Uh, my question uh, would be about, um, we know that in some countries, the support for democracy is decreasing hopelessly. So uh, uh, how, uh, especially in the actual uh, international economical context. So how AB uh, disseminating results and uh, having all this uh, impact in Africa can help to, to, to let people still uh, ha want democracy as uh, the best uh, way to govern ca their countries. Thank you, all of us. Thank you. The, Anybody if I may take it up, this? really the, sure. the, the quickest answer to your question, Yusuf, a great question is that, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to popular citizen aspirations, citizen de desires, there is still very strong and robust desire and aspiration to live under governments that are democratic and accountable. It, the challenge is a, it's a supply side challenge. It challenges that governments do not deliver and are not delivering democracy and accountable governance to the extent that their citizens desire. That sets up um, an interesting scenario, uh, but certainly it sets up a challenge for democracy advocates, for accountability advocates and uh, policy actors uh, to work on closing that deficit, work on closing that gap. And Afrobiometer data helps to sort of put an empirical note on this reality and helps to inspire those who want to do something about lack of accountability and accountable governance in Africa. Right, if you agree, we can move on to the question on elections. What is it that we consider at Afrobarometer when we look at presidential elections? Uh, Joe, do you want to take that question or? So, so if, yes, I may, if I may come in again, so we sure. are looking at, when we look at elections, first we are looking at levels of trust in election management authorities. We are looking at citizens' willingness, interest in voting, in going to the polls. We are looking at the, the degree to which citizens see the ballot box 
as the sole legitimate mechanism for acquiring power and for conferring power on political authorities. Um, we, are look, we sometimes do more detailed work, especially if we undertake pre-election surveys. And uh, you know, I, may, I, I must say that most of the time, our pre-election surveys have pretty much correctly called out what we've been, we've been able to call what the election results will be uh, in most cases. Uh, but that's not what we do. Pre-election survey is not our main business, but when we get the opportunity to do it, we are often pretty good at it. Just, just to add to that, I know the assistant who asked about when you know, faculty talk about the authenticity and the reliability of AB data. What Jim has just mentioned, of course, when you take a probometer, even just a pre-election survey, and you look at the final results of any elections, there's always a high correlation. And so it's one way to test the authenticity. But I also encourage for those who are in this and wanting to investigate our data, that's one of the aspects yeah, we look for. You know, the methodology of what the, we want to do reality on the continent. And I think in some ways, students or researchers can investigate and critique our data in ways that allows us to improve our own methodology. And so that happens a lot with some students as well. They take the data and try to find if there are any issues with it. It has to be of the highest quality. Um, Sorry, yeah. So, Yes. Could I also just add on to what um, Prof. Juma and Joe have mentioned, which is um, just for all of everyone who's attending, just to also make use of our online data analysis toolkit, which is on our website, and I will be sharing the link. Um, all of the um, questions that both of them have spoken about, um, we do have them clustered into themes on our ODA toolkit and people are able to look at the stats for themselves if they would like to do that as well. Thank you, Jamie. This is the last uh, question that we will answer. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, uh, time is against us. We have a question on the modules for round 10. Uh, Caroline, uh, Prof. Joe, Bonnie, Anybody can come in. Okay. Um, uh, so we've got uh, great plans for round 10 on some new special modules that we'll do. Um, I'll ask colleagues to help me out if I can't come up with the full list, but we um, will uh, be doing uh, work again on gender, on youth. Um, we're returning to the issue of migration uh, and cross-border trade. Um, and globalism and the role of the role and voice of Africa globally. Um, let's see, gender, it will have a bit of content on gender equality. Bonnie, can you help me out on other topics? I don't have the full list in front of me, Joe. All right. I think um, so. The newest one we're introducing is sexual reproductive health and rights. Yes. That is going to be attitudes towards. Um, safe abortion and contraception on the continent. We will also um, and get, have one module on youth, which will be focusing on youth issues uh, on the continent. And we certainly have climate change as a major theme again for, for this round. But these are the, the major ones. For... And access to justice is, I think, access the other one. Perhaps just to add that the, apart from the new modules, we'll still continue to carry uh, some of our signature questions and that do allow, I think, comparison over time just to look at where countries were from the time Afrobarometer started uh, up to now. So I think that's also something I think that is worth the highlighting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions, for the brilliant conversation. We've unfortunately run out of time. I apologize if we were not able to uh, take your question. Uh, thanks to our wonderful panel of experts for sharing uh, your invaluable insights. Uh, we appreciate your time and commitment uh, uh, for being with us today. Uh, 
je ne saurais conclure sans m'adresser en français aux collègues qui sont sur euh, qui ont qui participent à cette conférence de presse euh, pour vous remercier chaleureusement euh, de votre présence aujourd'hui, mais également pour vous dire que nous prendrons attache avec vous très rapidement pour les ateliers de euh, formation euh, annoncés par notre euh, directeur général jo, euh, Joseph euh, Asunka. Euh, N'hésitez pas encore une fois à vous, à vous approcher de des coordonnateurs de la communication, comme je l'ai dit, dans chaque région. région. Euh, sur cette note, je vous dis euh, au revoir, à très bientôt et encore merci. And it is a goodbye from us here in uh, Accra, Ghana. Thanks for, very much for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah.